Welcome. Lynn B. Thurgood here with Oxford Wealth Advisors. Uh, welcome to this monthly market update. Uh, today's topic is uh, focusing on who do you love? And uh, we're going we're gonna to really focus basically on three things today. Number one, we're going to talk about assets and the proper distribution of assets, uh, probate and and avoiding probate. So we'll, we'll go through that. I've got some of that already pre-drawn up here on the board, and we're gonna go through that together in just a minute. <clears throat> the second topic is going to be the proper naming of beneficiaries on assets so that we make sure that uh, uh, we get things distributed properly. And then the third agenda item for today uh, is to discuss some strategies to enhance or increase, uh, protect assets and have them in the most tax advantage way to distribute to those that we love. So that's what the message is, is today, uh, is, uh, who do you love and, uh, what do you love type of thing? And that's appropriate. We just enjoyed, uh, Valentine's day in February. So that's, that's going to be the topic. So I'm going to jump right on in. Uh, uh, this is being recorded. So if you want to have access to this at a later time, you just contact our office and we can provide you the, uh, the link so that you can watch this at your leisure. Uh, I know that uh, the invitation has gone out to many to participate today, and we have several joining us live. And uh, we always like to have this available for replay or for those that couldn't join us in the middle of a, of a Friday. Uh, this is my new piece of uniform here. I'm, I'm calling it Have Mask, Will Travel. <laughs> uh, it's replaced my tie. So anyways, uh, it's interesting times that we're living in today, that's for sure. Okay, so let's dig right on in here. Assets. And I'm going to kind of turn sideways here, and I'll be this way or that way. Uh, hopefully it works. But we have... These assets that we accumulate during our lifetime, there are reportable assets and there are non-reportable. When I say reportable, I'm, I'm referring to the, the IRS, Big Daddy. Uh, Big Daddy wants to know what you got. So stuff that's non-reportable right here, pre-33 gold and silver coins. Some of you have heard us talk about those in the past, uh, what we call wealth insurance. Uh, gold and silver are a great hedge against the falling dollar, against uh, market volatility. And uh, if they are pre-33, we don't care how pretty they are, they are non-reportable. They're treated kind of like, like an heirloom, something that we can own and we don't have to tell anybody about. And when we pass them on to our family or those that we love, uh, outside of family, it's not reportable by them either. So that's an interesting asset. The other non-reportable assets are foreign real estate <laughs> and offshore gold. We don't dabble in those last two, but, but in the pre-33, we do have a wholesale relationship that we've connected many of you with to accumulate some of that uh, pre-33 gold and silver. We encourage that as a Oh, five to 10% of your investable assets, not a bad idea. All right, anyway, everything else is reportable. <laughs> so that's a quick catch up on assets and who knows and that type of thing. Now, now that we've got these assets, our goal is to use and enjoy those assets. But if not, we wanna make sure that we can pass those assets on to our family, to charity, to who or what we love and what we care about. Got to pay attention to some planning here, okay? Because there is probate or no probate, all right? Now, in New Mexico, probate is not that scary. There are some states where it's a nightmare. Uh, Oklahoma apparently is terrible. Uh, Texas is not that friendly, um, although not as bad. Uh, California is a disaster in, in the probate area. But uh, New Mexico is not terrible either. But we want to avoid probate as, as much as possible because when we go through the probate process of moving assets out of our name and into somebody else's pocket, it's public record. 
meaning it's published in the newspaper. You've seen it, I'm sure. Um, they say so-and-so's estate is publishing this notice that they have passed away, graduated as I call it. And if anybody has claim on these assets, they need to contact blah, 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 blah. Well, that just invites people to come out of the woodwork. And there are people that do that to tie up the estate in false claims. And it's just delays and, and everybody's business. And, and that's what happens in the probate process. Most of the time, probate is going to take somewhere between three to six months. Um, and then just the public record and the, and, the, and the people out of the woodwork thing. We want to avoid that as much as possible. This occurs if there is no will or no trust that's been set up. Okay. If you have not set up a will or a trust, then that's going to have a probate exposure. There's a way around that. You pass away, you graduate what's called intestate. Got to love these terms. Intestate, meaning no will, no, no trust, no estate planning in place. Well, then that's going to go through probate. The probate process is to determine who gets the assets. That involves judges and attorneys and fees and everything else that uh, gobble up the estate, a certain percent anyway. Or you didn't name beneficiaries on the assets. And look at this. A lot of people I talk to say, oh, I've got a will. It's been set up. We're good to go. We don't have to worry about probate. Well, folks, a will is simply a document with a bunch of writing and a bunch of instructions on it. Okay? It has no validity until it goes in front of a probate judge to validate, put the stamp, the seal of approval on the will that says, okay, you may execute the instructions in the will. Until that gets to the judge to put the stamp on, the will is nothing but a piece of paper. So a will goes through probate. That's all I'm trying to clarify here. So I said probate if you don't have a will. Well, there's probate if you do have a will. So don't think that avoids probate. And then, of course, if you have assets in multiple states, then you're going to have to deal with probate transfers in each state and, and their probate laws and rules and regulations. So that's a lot of headache. Well, you're gone. You, you graduated. You checked out. That's a headache you left behind for the others. Okay. So anyway, that's, that's the issues of assets getting distributed via a probate process. How do we avoid probate? If we avoid probate, then the asset transfer is private. It's going to take maybe two to three weeks as a whole. And it's nobody's business. <laughs> it's private. Now, how do we do that? You can set up a POD on bank accounts. Pay on death. POD. You go to the bank, you say, hey, I want to name beneficiary on my bank account, checking, saving CDs, whatever. They'll get you the paperwork. You fill it out. They don't typically proactively ask you to do this. You kind of have to go tell them that that's what you want done. You can set up a transfer on death declaration on your investment accounts, brokerage accounts, that type of thing. T-O-D. Uh, you can set up a transfer on death deed on property. Various states allow you to set up beneficiaries on your property. That avoids probate. All right. So these are all tools to avoid probate because we're naming beneficiaries. That's a great tool. Avoid probate, name beneficiaries. And of course, you can set up beneficiaries individually. This is something I'm going to come to on our second uh, uh, whiteboard here where we make sure we name beneficiaries properly individually. You can set up a revocable living trust that avoids probate. And these types of transactions typically are non-reportable. So that's a good thing. So that's kind of a quick overview on the asset distribution idea. Now I'm going to switch gears here and get into a discussion about beneficiaries. So I'm going to erase the board here real quick. This is all live. So you get to see me and, and my wonderful erasing capabilities as I get into this other topic and start drawing on the border again. So don't go away. Uh, I'll keep talking as I do this.
We want to make sure that when we name beneficiaries, that we name them properly. Okay. So let me get in here. Who do you love? Okay. The red doesn't work. I should have checked that ahead of time. I didn't. So we'll go off of that and keep with the good steady black marker. Who and what do you love? All right. And so in that regard, we're going to focus on beneficiaries. Well, I'll call them bennies. Bennies. There are typically two types of beneficiary designations that you can set up. One is called per stirpes, and the other is per capita. By the way, this is the default. Per capita, if you don't specify, is the default designation. Remember that. What does it mean? Let's say that we have three beneficiaries, okay? And let's say that those beneficiaries have a couple of kids as well. All right. If I have set up a beneficiary uh, per capita and I have three children on my assets, whether it's inside of the trust or it's specifically naming beneficiaries outside of the will. By the way, if I name beneficiaries, that supersedes anything in the will. You have probate law, the will. You have contract law, naming of beneficiaries. And then you have the, the trust, revocable living trust uh, documentation that... Uh, takes care of things as well. So, so when I'm naming by contract or in the trust beneficiaries, per capita means this, equally to each individual named or the stated percentage that I named them for. Everybody's different. Sometimes I'll see folks that'll name, you know, 25 here, 25 here, and 50 there. Uh, but most commonly, it's usually a hat, you know, a third, a third, a third. But in this scenario, per capita, if that's the way we set it up equally, a third, a third, a third, and one of those intended beneficiaries graduates prematurely, what happens? What happens? Under the per capita, earlier we were going to get a third, a third, a third. Well, now that that one named beneficiary has graduated ahead of us, the surviving two children inherit 50-50. And what happens to those children of the deceased intended beneficiary? They get nothing. We accidentally disinherited, if you will, those three grandchildren. Now, that may be okay, that may not be, but at least be aware of and, and make that appropriate decision when you're setting up these beneficiaries. That's the per capita, okay? So how do we fix that? If we really want, in the event of one of our beneficiaries tipping over, checking out, graduating, we want to make sure that their share stays in the family we do a per stirpes designation on the beneficiary where we name those individuals with their stated percentage, and then we state per stirpes. We have to state that. As again, I said, if you don't say anything, it's per capita. That's the default. And we end up disinheriting. If you want that money to stay in the family, then you do per stirpes, and that will allow the money to pass properly to the named beneficiary, okay? Or if they have graduated on us to their children, it stays in the bloodline. It does not go to the spouse, ex-spouse. It goes to children of the named beneficiary, okay? That's per stirpes. So very important that when we set things up that you do that properly so that uh, the money gets where you want it to go. All right.
Who do you love? What do you love? All right. Now, when you name beneficiaries, you need to be very specific. You can't just name beneficiaries saying, oh, all children equally. That'll work. That was the old school. That doesn't work. You need to have specifically name. You need to name them specifically with their full name, their date of birth, their social security number, their phone number, their address, and the stated percentage, along with the per stirpes or the per capita, whatever you're trying to do there. All right, does that make sense? Now, that may require you to go back on some of your previously uh, set up accounts and verify how are these beneficiaries set up? Do I have them all named individually? Do I have their social security numbers on file? This greatly accelerates the claim process. I'm not saying that if you have something all children equally, it's not going to work. Uh, it's just going to delay it significantly because now they have to confirm identity and all kinds of other stuff way beyond if you had done the specifics up front. So just be aware of that and uh, help your heirs uh, to have a little easier time in getting those assets transferred. All right. Let me see here. What else do I want to show? Oh, there's another beneficiary designation tool. It's called a restricted, a restricted beneficiary endorsement. Do you want to control money from the grave? I'm not going to draw this on the board. Uh, a trust will give you a lot of control over how assets are to be distributed once you're gone. You don't need a trust to do that, though. Uh, many types of custodians have a uh, restrictive endorsement available. It's a beneficiary form that says, you know what, I'm not going to allow Johnny or Jill to take that money lump sum and blow it or, or have the ex-spouse get their hands on it or they get into a lawsuit and lose it all. You can set up what's called a restricted payout on certain types of assets. Not all custodians offer this. Uh, certainly the, the green money annuities, uh, they do, and, and, and others, uh, some life insurance type things do. Find out, find out. But a restricted endorsement is this. We're going to make this money come to you over a five-year period of time, or maybe a 10-year period of time, or we're going to make it lifetime. I don't recommend that, by the way, but, but you might want to restrict it to protect them from themselves or protect them from creditors or ex-spouses or whatever, just understand that's an option and you can pick and choose. You may have uh, one or two or three of the kids that are just fine, they're, they're good with money, but you may have one that there's a bit of a challenge and you wanna protect them from themselves. You can set up a restricted payout endorsement and, and that asset will be sent to them on a little by little basis, okay? You can do a lot of that inside of a trust and, and that's frequently why people set up trusts is to have more control from the grave of, of asset distribution. I'm just saying you don't need a trust to be able to control some assets uh, from uh, you know, distribution and getting blown. Some of our clients are like, well, if they blow it, that there's, that's their problem. And that's fine. I'm, we're just teaching ideas, tools, and, and concepts, and you employ what you feel comfortable with. Okay, that's it on the beneficiary designation. Now let's talk uh, here as we, as we wind this up about a legacy, some legacy planning ideas and, and how to protect our assets from poor health and uh, you know, make sure that they're gonna pass on the most tax advantage way possible. I'm gonna introduce you to uh, a concept that I, the acronym is TOOT, T-E-W-T, TOOT, T-E-W-T, TOOT. Tax elimination wealth transfer. This is a great concept that we've educated folks on. Let's say that we have a million dollars in an IRA retirement type account. It could be 200, 500, 5 million, two, whatever. Just using easy numbers here. I just want to share the concept. And if any of these concepts are of interest to you, call the office. We'll set up a, a chat to personalize that to exactly what you're trying to accomplish. Tax elimination, wealth transfer, okay? We all know that our IRA money is 100% taxable and Uncle Sam keeps a good eye on that. Our intent is that when we graduate, when we check out, we want that money to go to our family, our kids, our grandkids, et cetera, right? 
and all those little guys running around, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And, and we got other kids and we got other grandkids and so on and so forth. That's where, that looks like somebody's eyes. <laughs> anyway, we want that money to get to them. The problem is before that money, when we check out, gets to them, there's somebody in between us and them. And who is that? It's our least favorite uncle, what we call Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam says, oh, no, you're not sending that money to your family until I get my piece, okay, and taxes, right? And we know that uh, from a standpoint of the state and the federal taxes on IRA accounts, that could be anywhere from 15 to 30 percent federal, plus the state's going to get its 5, 8 percent, whatever. The bottom line is we're looking at easily 30 to 40% of that money is going to be gobbled up by Uncle Sam if it's done in a one-time transfer. Most people generally don't do the whole transfer all at once, but I'm just saying that's the exposure. It's gonna get taxed at some level before it gets to the family. How do we fix that? That's what I wanna share with you here for the next few minutes. Uh, tax elimination, wealth transfer. We're gonna redirect some of this money about maybe 3% a year to this tax elimination account, wealth transfer account. And this is going to provide the following benefits. It's going to provide about $1 million tax-free. It creates an account with a guaranteed $1 million tax-free. as a death benefit. So at my death or the death of my, my spouse, uh, that money is gonna be tax-free benefit to my family, okay? Goes to my family. And, whoops, not T, family. And they get it again, what? Tax-free, tax elimination, wealth transfer, okay? Great, great concept here. Tax-free. Okay, so I'm pulling a little bit of money out of here to fund this to provide that tax-free benefit. I've taken care of my family. I love my family. I want them to get that money tax-free. I don't want Uncle Sam getting his hands on it. Now, as, as I do this and I check out, well, there's still a lot of money left here. It still could go through the Uncle Sam filter to get to my family and the taxes are still there. So I, I've, I've taken a step to protect my family tax-free, but I still have a tax problem. Well, if I name over here a 501c3 or other type of nonprofit charity as a beneficiary on the remaining asset, that money when I check out will go to them tax free, okay? My family got money over here tax free and all Uncle Sam got was taxes on the, on the money I withheld every year to fund this contract, okay? Tax elimination, wealth transfer, a great way to leverage money 3% a year on a million is 30,000 a year that we redistributed. After taxes, maybe we got about 24,000 a year that went here. And that creates this guaranteed benefit tax-free. One little thing as I end, this is not just a death benefit play. This is a protect your assets from poor health play. Long-term care money is available here. You can take an advance on that million dollars tax-free, up to 500,000 or more, you can get out of there while you're still living tax-free money to pay for long-term care. And then what's left goes to the family tax-free when I graduate. So there you go. That's the concept for today. If you have any interest in the tax elimination wealth transfer, call the office. We can show you quotes based on whatever your numbers are 
how it works. We don't have to go through a bunch of elaborate trusts and attorney and all kinds of stuff. It's a simple concept to simply leverage money in the most tax advantaged way to those that we love. Okay. All right. That's it for this session. Uh, we hope that you're all staying well and healthy. Uh, we're doing these market updates the last Friday of every month. So we encourage you to tune in. And again, as always, uh, it'll be available per your request uh, to, to review at a later time. Uh, the uh, message for today as I close, stay positive, test negative. <laughs> Take care for now. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs>